welcome, welcome to everyone. Welcome to Be Her Talk, an award-winning talk show that adds a taste of hip-hop, a side of Shakur, and spice to unflavored news. Each Sunday, we dissect and discuss race, politics, and culture from an unapologetic Black millennial perspective. And for the next several weeks, I'm happy to announce that we partner with Black Enterprise as our official media sponsor as we unpack the 2020 election and its impact on the Black community. My name is Selena Hill. I'm the digital editor at Black Enterprise and the founder of Be Her Talk. And I'm super excited to be here with you all today to talk about Joe Biden's politics and policies with a very special guest. We have CNN political analyst Bakari Sellers, who will be joining our show a little later on. But first, let me kick it back to my co-host, Stanley Fritz, to introduce himself. What's going Here. on? Fritz. You can find me on the Twitter streets at Stan Fritz. You can find me on IG at Stan Fritz. You can find me on Snapchat at Dark Skin Swindle, where I use my thought filters to look even cuter than I actually am. Don't believe me? Go check out the IG page. Y'all supposed to gas me up. What's going on? Oh, <laughs> it's true though. You did look. You did look really nice in your um using the filter that you posted up. You did, Stanley. That was half-hearted. Tammy, save me, queen. I guess so. I mean, you're a natural beauty. You don't need filters. I'm not going to advocate for all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, Tammy, I'm happy to be here with you and Selena. This show's going to be really fun. Got a lot to talk about. But what's going on with you? How can we hear from you, Tammy? Hi. Happy Sunday, y'all. Super happy to be here. What's shaking to all of our listeners? Um, I am so excited for today's show. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tammy David, and I'm known here at Be Heard Talk as your problematic fave. Today, I can't wait to hear Bakari Sellers try to sell me on tired Joe Biden, someone I still can't believe the Democratic Party had the balls to nominate. Um, but you know what? It is what it is. I may be disappointed by his lack of enthusiasm, but do we really have a choice, folks? No, we do not. Anyway, before we get to all of that good stuff, I am happy to lead you to the News Roundup, which is our weekly segment where we discuss the stories that have us shook up, stirred up, and ready to delete our Twitter accounts if they're not already suspended first like Stanley's has been. I was only suspended for seven days this time. Seven days. Mind you, this man gets suspended from Twitter at least once a year, y'all. So please follow him because he is pretty funny and it's with good reason. I was not supposed to know you can't call Candace Owen a poon poon. That's you can. It's just that Twitter is fascist and that's what it is. Agreed. That's all. Today, we're going to talk about the shocking news from Friday that has serious national legal ramifications the latest in Kanye's shenanigans that might not actually be that unhinged. And we're gonna give you a little lesson on the US's history of sterilizing women of color. So bear with us and as always, follow and DM us at Be Heard Talk if anything hits your newsfeed that you wanna talk about next week. So first and most importantly, Notorious RBG, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a legal, cultural, and feminist icon, has died Friday of complications from metastatic cancer of the pancreas. She was 87 years young. The Supreme Court announced her death, saying the cause was complications, of course, and that she died at her home in Washington, D.C., surrounded by family and loved ones. She's known for her legal fight for the women's rights in 1970s, and she served for 27 years on the nation's highest court, becoming its most prominent member. Beyond the sadness of losing an important feminist icon and an inspiration for women across America, many are panicked that this means Trump and the Republican Party will be choosing the justice to replace her, which will undoubtedly be catastrophic for human and civil rights in our country. A week after the upcoming presidential election, the court is scheduled for the third time to hear a challenge brought, brought by Republicans to the Affordable Care Act. And the Supreme Court is the entity that has defended DACA, state abortion rights, and so much more. So things are not looking good for liberals. 
Hours after, after the announcement of her death, Senator Mitch McConnell vowed that Trump's pick would get a Senate vote, although a few Republican senators like Susan Collins of Maine have spoken out against voting so early. And of course, on Saturday evening in a rally in Fayetteville, North Carolina, Trump said he is moving quickly to choose a candidate and hinted that his candidate will be a woman. So Stanley, first I wanna ask, is it possible to choose a justice this early, like in the process? And do you think that we need Congress's approval? We do need the Senate's approval. And it is possible for the president to pick a Supreme Court candidate this early and propose the Senate to vote on. They usually have a short list of, of potential candidates that they want to add on there. So all he has to do is go through his list of potential Supreme Court um, people and pick a name and put them out there for the Senate to vote on. We know Mitch McConnell is the majority leader of the New York State Senate, and he is deeply motivated to get somebody through, even though when Justice Scalia died 236 days before the election, he refused to put someone up to a vote for President Obama because he said, he said it was too close to the election. We're less than 60 days away from the general election, and the Republican Party is pretty much going to break away from what they said back in 2016, so they can push someone through. Dang. Selena, I know that RBG is super famous for being just like super outspoken, really powerful woman and feminist and just like, honestly, kind of a firecracker, especially yeah. considering her role. What are some of the things that you're going to miss most having her presence in the Supreme Court? And how do you see that dynamic changing over the next few years? Yeah, of course. So Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was a legal, cultural and feminist icon, as well as the architect of the legal fight for women's rights back in the 70s. Not only that, but she changed the way the world is for women as we know it. Um, even before she was uh, appointed, her first judicial appointment back in 1980, she was fighting for gender equality. And even she even said, um, you know, her fight was definitely all about advocating for women and equality in a number of landmark decisions. We all know that um, the important role she played in Roe versus Wade. I think that with her absence, her, her absence, um, it, it's, it's pivotal, not just on the Supreme Court, but in the world as we know it. She was, a, again, a fierce leader. And without her in, in that seat, um, we don't know how the Supreme Court is going to rule on a number of landmark decisions, uh, including Obamacare, that's something that's up. You know that Republicans have been fighting to overturn Roe versus Wade um, for, for generations, for decades. So we know that that's also uh, a sub something that could be up in the air. Um, and, you know, to your earlier point about the, the political fight that's happening, uh, Mitch McConnell is a complete hypocrite. In, in, in 2016, he spent almost one year postponing and blocking President Barack Obama's nominee. Um, because he refused to let uh, a justice, that justice, um, excuse me, uh, Merrick Garland, um, you know, even just go to the Senate uh, and have and go through a, a, a fair and just process to be to see if he would be, you know, fit for the, the seat. And not only that, he wasn't even radical, like he was pretty moderate in a number of ways. So I feel like, again, Justice uh, Ginsburg, she was the leader of the liberal wing. And her death will have a profound consequence on not only the court, but our country. I just want to clarify real quick. Yes. I said New York State Senate. Sorry, I meant the United States Senate. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Hey, hey, can I just add one more thing? I love Michelle Obama, but I'm sick of going high when Republicans continue to go low with their dirty politics and tactics. They've proven that they'll do anything to win, including putting American lives and important court decisions in jeopardy. And it's like, I feel like the Democrats should absolutely do any and everything that they can in their power to block uh, Trump's nominee, even though they do have a majority in the Senate. So I don't, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm just so sick of the Republicans, honestly. It's a really sad and stressful time. All I can really say is just rest in peace and, I wish the best for her family. As we watch this play out, we're gonna keep y'all posted because obviously this position is of utmost importance for this upcoming year, especially seeing as Republicans control everything now. So let's hope that they can stall, that we can stall and we can move forward with this. 
Um, speaking of feminist icons, our next story is huge news for the hip hop world. Cardi B filed for divorce from Offset on this Tuesday, September 15th in Fulton County, Georgia, citing that her marriage was irretrievably broken. Court documents state that she is asking the court to award her primary legal and physical custody of baby culture. When news of this first popped up, unbothered fans were the first to say, I told you so, going over the ridiculous number of times Offset has publicly been caught cheating and dragged through the dirt by Cardi's Bodak baddies. However, Bel Callis took to Instagram Live on September 18th, just two days ago, to clarify the mess and the rumors and said that they were splitting up not because of his cheating, but simply because people just grow apart sometimes. She deaded a few rumors, including one that Offset has a baby on the way and explained that after four years, she was just tired of arguing and not seeing eye to eye with him. She said that when you feel like it's just not the same anymore, before you actually get cheated on, I'd rather just leave. Well, it's a little too late for that, Cardi B, but power to you. Stanley, Mr. Black Men Don't Cheat, do you think Cardi is lying to protect her reputation and that Offset is still cheating? Or do you think that it's just really like, a disintegrated marriage that they just grew apart. First off, Tammy, the number one cause of divorce is marriage. <laughs> Secondly, it is a scientific fact that black men do not cheat. Oh, well, Sagittarius, well, Offset is a Sagittarius. And so, you know, those of you who are astrology fans, if you don't lock them down, Sagittarius can be finicky. So, yeah, I'm like, listen, he's not even black, he's Migo. So, I don't know what, like, black men don't cheat. There's been no proof that any black man is cheating, so I'm good. Selena, are you happy for her, or are you low-key going to miss them together? Because they're kind of cute. Oh, I was rooting for them. Their story, to me, like, they had such the quintessential hip-hop love story. And for many of us, they were keeping, many of us singles, they were keeping black love alive. Like, it, it just shows, especially, like, I'm rooting, I'm rooting for, for Cardi, right? She's a girl from the Bronx who literally became so successful in her life and at 25 was, you know, at the top of her career, had a marriage, had a child. And I was just like, oh my God, Cardi is goals. Look, I'm happy that she's making this decision for herself. And like, obviously she's, you know, financially stable and independent and does not have to depend on anyone because, you know, she secures her own bags. But yeah, this is, this is one for the culture. Like, I think many of us were rooting for them and, I don't, I really wish Offset could have got it together. If you ask me, he, honestly, he was greedy, he was selfish, he needed sex therapy, and he needed Jesus. You agree? Wait, 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 wait. First of all, why were they goals? Why would anyone make Cardi B and Offset goals? We don't even know Offset's real name. What do you mean? Okay, first of all, isn't his real name Kiari, which is super cute? Like, he, first of all, their goals because they're rich as hell, pretty as hell, and they have it all in their- And that baby, did you see how cute culture is? Oh, come on. Word. I will find an ugly baby. And if you do, sorry to that baby. So, like, that's not really saying much. And they're like, all right, cool. They got divorced. We don't know these people. <laughs> so does Offset. Looking forward to the Culture 3. Personally, I feel like I saw this coming, and I'm with you, Selena. I loved them as a couple. They were super cute. I always felt like I watched Love and Hip Hop, and men dogged Cardi B, like, the whole show. Like, no one ever respected her. People treated her super badly. Um, apparently, we have a comment. So, Selena, let me toss it to you. Yeah, so shout out to everyone who is watching, uh, watching us via live on Facebook. Somebody who is watching us on Facebook via Black Enterprise, John Womick, he says, Cardi B reminds me of Democratic voters. Keep staying in abusive relationships. Ooh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. I am so oh, like, God. like they were gold. But I am happy for her. She's too bad for all that mess. She needs someone who can handle her right. She's crazy. So She's, Cardi, she would have killed Offset eventually. So Cardi B should leave Offset, right? And then go to the guy that's going to beat her and call her the N-word, i.e. the Republican Party. Is that what John Womack is, like, alluding to? That's a, Maybe. 
Okay, well, the analogy is a little flawed, Stanley, but John is correct. I'm glad that Cardi can be her bad single self, and hopefully she can find someone that, you know, can handle it properly and doesn't need to go double dipping with strippers and waitresses. <laughs> Those are entrepreneurs, Tammy. Please respect them, okay? Yeah, you're valid. I respect yeah. them, but, like, come on. You're gonna, you have Cardi B. You have... Cardi B, she broke records with her first album. She was the only rap queen bad enough to step to Nicki Minaj. And you gonna step out on her? That's crazy. What about M double I S double I S P? Whatever her name is in P Valley, Mississippi. Who's that? Stripper from P Valley. Yeah, I'm sorry, Stanley. I haven't watched the show yet. I mean, what are y'all doing with y'all lives? Watch P Valley. Okay, we promise, we promise to do that. <laughs> anyway, moving along with the news roundup, we have more crazy celebrity news for you. And this one, I can't wait to get y'all takes on. So drop comments in the Zoom, drop comments on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, because I want to hear from y'all. Kanye West's latest outrageous tweets have been more than ludicrous and have his fans questioning his well-being once again. The latest is him waging a battle against Universal and Sony, and honestly, the entire music industry, in an effort to get his kids his masters for, his, for their future financial benefits. It starts with a rant that includes calling record deals and NBA contracts modern day slavery, and he promises to, quote, do everything in his legal power and use his voice until all artist contracts are changed. He tweets that he will not stop and promises that he is petty and very personal, continuing that his moment, him doing this, is going to change the music industry for good. He tweeted every single page of his contracts with Universal. There are 10 of them because Twitter wouldn't let him upload a PDF, asking every lawyer in the world to look them over. However, he's not that crazy for this because he's not the first artist this year to have public issues with their record label, including Taylor Swift and Megan Thee Stallion recently publicly sharing their own issues. He began, after tweeting screenshots of the entire uh, label agreement to talk about doing more about it and speaking to music's biggest men in business. That's when he got a little bit more outlandish and these are the headlines you might recognize. He shared a video of himself urinating on his Grammy award, which was in the toilet. And then he tweeted, trust me, I won't stop calling himself baby Putin. And then he promised to fix other broken agreements in business deals, like the partnership between Adidas and Puma, and like the very personal partnership that was dissolved between him and Jay-Z. Now, a source close to him and Kim Kardashian West is saying that Kim is at the end of her rope and feeling powerless over his latest antics. He's off his meds and he's escalating, so now his fans are wondering when this bubble of delusion will burst. But is he really that crazy? So first, Stanley, is Kanye correct? Is he powerful enough, you think, to actually do something about this? Or do you think that this might blunder his career? Kanye's an idiot. His career is not going to be blundered, but he's an idiot. And he doesn't care about other artists. He cares about himself. He cares about his money. He also has signed multiple deals with Universal and, and Def Jam. It isn't like he couldn't have gotten out of this deal a long time ago. He's mad now because apparently he's trying to do something and he can't do it because he can't get out of his deal. But artists have been signing bad deals for years. Where have you heard Kanye talking about it? You haven't. He probably has an album coming out or is unhappy because they want to prove something in his album budget. I'm not, I don't care for Kanye. That's fair. But honestly, don't you think it changes a little bit that it's for his kids? Like maybe something with his family prompted this? No, I don't think so. I think Kanye's a narcissist and this is about him. And he's gaslighting by saying it's about a bigger movement where everyone else. So it's a combination of narcissism, grandioseness, and maybe just he's having an episode. But this is not, artists have been getting screwed over. Labels should give artists their masters back. He's right about that. But he doesn't care. The minute Universal gives him a deal that he feels better about, he'll shut right up about this. 
Okay, so Selena, to that point, like, what do you think about the disrespect? Do you think that him peeing on his Grammy, acknowledging his broken relationship with Jay, calling himself Putin, are they tactical and like him pressuring the label, the labels, or is he just doing this to grab attention because he's totally unhinged? Well, before I answer that question, John Wilmer, uh, Will Mack wrote another comment on uh, Black Enterprises Facebook feed. He says Kanye 2020. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, oh, come on. Come on, John. I, was coming, John. I he, was rooting for you until you come with that mess. John, we could use the fodder. Um, look, I'll say this. Kanye has, you, he, it's been disclosed that he is battles from um, manic depression. He is bipolar. I think he's having an episode. I feel sorry for him and the, uh, Kim and the kids. Um, you know, I, I agree with Stanley. I think it's self-serving. Um, I don't think you can trust someone who has, who says bizarre, outrageous things all the time on public platforms and completely, completely humiliates his family uh, and himself and his legacy. I mean, look, I, I get it. He was pissing on the, the Grammy, um, you know, but again, again, he has shown us that he's always seeking validation, particularly from these white owned institutions uh, like the Grammys and, you know, for, you know, and, and others as we have you. So I don't like, it's hard to follow. Like the, the Kanye shenanigans, they don't stop. Um, I don't, I, my question is why are people even talking or thinking about voting for him? Like, you gotta be kidding me. Because the other options are so bleak, Selena. They are so bleak. <laughs> Can we save this for the next topic? <laughs> I will. And you know what? I'm gonna bring up Kanye 2020 as a third party candidate. <laughs> you vote for somebody that can't even put out an album out on time? Valid. That's fair. Listen, I know, I know his antics are unhinged, and I know that he's a crazy narcissist who is doing outrageous things in self-serving interests, but I do think that this particular topic is really interesting and really pertinent, and I think that because of Kanye's following and his ability to grab headlines, I do think that it's going to get him a seat at the table with Universal and Sony to talk about this, because ultimately, he is putting their legal business on blast, and whether or not it goes somewhere for him they have to do something about it so i'm curious to see like the next steps and i hope that he does share how his meeting with these you know executives go and before we wrap up and get to our main topic i just want to throw a really serious topic um, into everybody's radar. I think so far we've had, you know, a little bit of fun talking about feminist history and celebrity drama. Um, but I just want to bring up something that has a serious history in the U.S. that a whistleblower has just let us know. Don Wooten, who previously worked at an ICE facility in Georgia, has come out detailing a high rate of hysterectomies and alleged medical neglect in a complaint filed to the Department of Homeland Security. Basically, ICE is sterilizing women in custody. Her complaint notes that a doctor admitted to re removing the wrong ovary during one operation. One woman woke up from surgery to discover one of her fallopian tubes removed. And some are questioning whether the surgeries were medical necessary. Hint, they were not. Many report retaliation against those who complain or speak out, and that many of these cases were known but hidden to the public for fear of co consequences like deportation and lengthy legal trouble. These reports not only solidify Trump's presidency as a cruel and inhumane experiment against immigrants, namely women of color, but hearken to the U.S.'s nasty and often hidden past of forced sterilization, particularly in communities of color. Selena, considering the history of forced sterilization, is this surprising to you at all? Absolutely. I mean, it, it's 2020. So yes, it, it, it does come, it, there's a lot of shock, right? The absurdity. But like you said, there is a deep, dark, disgusting history of eugenics, which you touched on. In fact, everything the Nazis knew about eugenics, they learned from the United States. It actually started in 1927 with the Buck versus Bell Supreme Court case, where they ruled, uh, where the court ruled the state of Virginia had the right to sterilize a 20-year-old named Carrie Buck against her will. And that sort of catapulted this era of racist population engineering by state governments. It went as far as there were th in 32 states, there were federally funded eugenic boards uh, with, where 
taxpayer dollars were used to sterilize approximately 70,000 people, mostly women and disproportionately black women. And again, this was to enforce America as a white country. Um, then, you know, we even had in the 1960s and 70s, there were deputized doctors with the Indian Heritage, excuse me, the Indian Health Service. They were sterilizing uh, nearly a quarter of a quarter of Native American women that they deemed unfit to have children. Now, the history doesn't stop there. There, were, uh, there was another eugenics program in North Carolina that did not end until 1977. And in fact, a notorious white doctor who sterilized 16 black women at a South Carolina hospital in 1972, he was practicing up until 2012. So again, the history of eugenics and again, targeting black women in this way and women of color is long, disgusting, and it has not stopped. Stanley, do you think that given knowing the history of sterilizing black women, Puerto Rican women, Native American women, that Democrats this time around are gonna actually make moves on this? Because this is now huge news. I mean, I don't doubt the Democrats are trying to do something about this. They're not gonna just, just sit idly by as if we're doing eugenics. Um, I don't know if they'll be very effective. The Trump White House controls all of this, and there's only so much you can do without Republican support. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, honestly. That's fair. I'm curious to move things along and get to our main topic, because since we're talking about some of the things that, you know, Democrats might promise us in the upcoming year, let's get to talking about our candidate. So, Selena, I'm going to pass this off to you. Thanks for tuning in, y'all, to the News Roundup. We'll be back here every Sunday. Yep. Thank you so much for that, Tammy. And thank you so much for everyone who has chimed in and tuning in again via Facebook Live and also via our Zoom chat, which is going off as well. Now, just to kick things off with the main topic and our main featured guest, let me just start by saying it's clear Joe Biden would not be here if it wasn't for our support from the Black community. His primary campaign was revived by a decisive victory in South Carolina, where he won 60% of the Black vote in addition to several other states with large Black populations on Super Tuesday. Now, Biden will once again need our support in order to defeat Donald Trump in November. However, the question remains whether or not Black voters will show up with the same energy at the polls when it comes to November. We remember back in 2012, about 66% of eligible Black voters went to the polls to cast their vote. But in 2016, Black turnout fell to 59%. And that drop off was one of the key reasons Trump was able to pull narrow, a narrow victory over Hillary Clinton in a handful of swing states. Now, Biden has, even though he has overwhelming support among older Black voters, a number of younger Black voters under the age of 30 are more skeptical of the former vice president and say that voting doesn't even matter. And a, num a number of us are also questioning, what would he do for us? What would Biden do for our community? So to discuss what a Biden presidency would mean for Black America, we have CNN political analyst, best-selling author, and attorney Bakari Sellers. And fun fact, Bakari made history in 2006 when he was elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives at the age of 22, making him the youngest African-American to win a public office at the time. Thank you so much for joining us, Bakari. No, thank you for having me. And just you all's conversation has been so dope on a Sunday. I, yeah. was, I was just telling Stanley that, uh, you know, it's amazing. This is such a dope conversation to be having during the middle of NFL football. Uh, <laughs> that's how you know I love y'all because I'm here to support and, and do everything possible. So this is a, this is a great show and I, I look forward to tuning in more often. What's up? Yeah, Let's yeah so things were getting heated. Um, and, and it's great to see you again. I actually want to start this conversation by just asking you, which of Biden's policies would have the greatest impact on the Black community if he is elected? So that, that's a really good question. I, I can't tell you, I don't, I don't think it's fair to say a, a most or specific, but I will tell you during this time, one of the things that, that I watch for is a COVID relief plan and not just the public health aspect of it. Let, let's break it down. Black folk have been devastated by this disease or dying at a higher rate. 
Uh, we're having um, um, greater issues during our recovery. We're finding out that black people are having lung issues, they're having heart issues after they beat the disease or beat the virus. And so it's, it's that public health aspect of it, making sure that we have a vaccine that we can trust, making sure that we are following the science, et cetera. You put so that in, but that's just, that's just one bucket though. One of the, the, one of the other things which I find is going to be most crucial is the economic recovery from COVID. We all know that the fastest growing small businesses in the country were owned by who? Black women. We also know that there has been a devastating effect on small businesses throughout the country, particularly those black and brown owned businesses. And so when you're talking about COVID, or COVID relief, I don't want people just to look at the public health aspect, which is important. A national mass mandate, all of those things are important, but there has to be a direct infusion of capital. And you know, when you have a black vice president like Kamala Harris directing your COVID relief efforts, when you're talking about directly infusing capital into these small businesses, into these individuals of color, you couple that uh, economic relief that's needed. I think the unemployment rate for African Americans is about 15% right now during this COVID period. Um, that's not even talking about the unemployable, right? So when you're, when you're having this holistic discussion about COVID, I would argue that the most important thing that we have is not just the public health aspect. One of the most important things Joe Biden has to do in the first 100 days, which he's pledged to do, is give relief, direct relief, to these communities and to these businesses which are black owned, which are hurting right now. Thank you for that, Bakari. Stanley? So Bakari, I got a question for you actually. Um, you know, talking about the Biden administration and what they're gonna do for black folks, one of the things that has become really popular recently is a question about reparations. Um, and the Biden, I mean, the Biden team has already said that they would do a study, but I think the Congressional Black Caucus has already done one. Um, well, no, so that, that, that's not all the way together. Uh, HR 40 uh, is, is the bill that most people talk about. It was sponsored by John Conyers. Uh, it's been sponsored by Sheila Jackson Lee. And what, now the, the better question is why didn't Barack Obama do that? But this is a whole nother conversation. Uh, but what, what he's saying is that if we have a, a democratic house and you know the most important thing about all of this, we, Joe Biden can come out here and pro promise reparations today. If we don't have a democratic Senate, it ain't happening, right? So, you know, with <laughs> all good intentions, you know, so we have to make sure we're doing everything possible between now and November 3rd. But uh, HR 40 is a, is a good step. I think that one of the things that I would encourage you all to, to hold them accountable for and us to push for is to look at how these agencies work. You know, for me, I'm gonna be looking at um, how the Department of Treasury looks, right? I, I, you know, we've never had, I, I heard Selena talking about eugenics and going deep into the history thereof, but I have a random fact for you. Did you know we've never had a black person's signature on money in this country? Because the, the Secretary of the Treasury actually signs currency and we've actually never had that. And so when you're talking about the distribution of wealth, when you're talking about the distribution of federal dollars, looking in the treasury, looking who's over the Small Business Administration, for me in particular also, looking at the Department of Justice and who heads the Civil Rights Division, you know, people like Deval Patrick once, once uh, did that. But when you're having this larger conversation about reparations and the wealth distribution of people of color, we have to look at those separate uh, uh, agencies and entities. And yes, I, I do believe that it's a huge step that we got white moderates, white progressives talking about reparations and, and signing a bill that comes across their desk. But, but like, oh, Go ahead, Stanley. Finish your thought. You hear that? Bakari's on my side. Ah. <laughs> no, you have to understand how many times I've been cut off by Angela Rye on TV. So go ahead. <laughs> reparations here. And something I've been a little bit challenged by is like folks like Ice Cube and Diddy, who are like, don't vote for anybody unless they have a black agenda, as if we didn't go through a whole primary election. Um, and if I sound dismissive of them, I don't mean to be, but it's just frustrating. Like, does Biden, do Biden and Harris have an explicit black agenda or is it just like the things that would help everyone? So that's a good question. And the answer is yes. So, so not only do they have a black agenda. So this is, this is how you have to look at it, right? I look at it holistically and shout out to Cube and shout out to Diddy. I think bringing them in, I know that the Biden campaign has met with Cube. I, I know that people talk to Diddy often, but bringing them into the fold instead of just excommunicating them is, is very important in this discussion. 
However, not only does he have a black agenda, specific black agenda, all you got to do is like Google it, but he also has a black equity plan, right? Where you're talking about distributing wealth, where you're talking about revamping opportunity zones to make sure that African Americans can play a role in those things. Um, you're talking about housing. We all know that the major determinant of determining factor of wealth in this country is the ability to own a home, right? And so when you're talking about all of these various things which make a, a black agenda, you ask something, Stanley, so important. And this is what Democrats and Republicans do that pisses me off, right? They don't do well. What Democrats and Republicans like to say both is they like to have race neutral policies to fix race specific problems. Mm. The rising tide lifts all boats. And so this is the first time, this is literally the first time we've had an agenda or a black agenda and a black equity plan that delves into targeting specific areas, whether or not it's um, you know, access to STEM programs in high school, whether or not it's HBCUs, whether or not it's housing, whether or not it's access to capital as a small business, so you have, and COVID. So you have all of these things and they do have a black agenda. The funny part about your question though, um, <laughs> Stanley, is this. It's like nobody paid attention to the primary. Every single body running for president had a black agenda. You know why? We made them have a black agenda. I mean, you want to see some black agendas? Go look at Kamala's black agenda or Elizabeth Warren's black agenda or Julian Castro's black agenda, right? Everybody and their mama had a black agenda. For, so for those individuals who are all of a sudden saying that the Democratic Party didn't have one, you know, pump the brakes. But now, to bring, out, bring this all home, now you have a black agenda, you have a black equity plan, you have black COVID relief. Those are policy proposals. You have the implementation thereof through a black vice president, and you're going to get a black Supreme Court justice. You're going to have someone like uh, Danielle Holly Walker, who is the uh, dean of the Howard Law School, or Kentanji Brown Jackson, who weirdly enough, she's so dope, but she weirdly enough is Paul Ryan's like first or second cousin. I don't I, I don't I can't even explain that. <laughs> yeah, you have Michelle Childs, who's on the district court in South Carolina. You have Sherilyn Eiffel, who is the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. You have all of these amazing Black women who will be elevated to the Supreme Court. So when you look at it holistically, what do Black people have to lose, to steal a question from uh, Donald Trump, if we do not vote for Joe Biden, we have, again, to not only lose our fundamental rights that, we've been, that they've been eroding, um, but we have an amazing opportunity that will slip through our fingertips as well. Because I don't know, I do not know when we'll get another black Supreme Court justice if we don't get one right now. You might get well, Bacardi, interesting. I'm, I'm so happy you clarified more on the black agenda. It is really great to know that like specifically as a candidate, um, Biden is looking toward bettering black communities. However, I have a question on that same line that is, I guess, a little bit more difficult when we talk about, you know, um, going out to the polls. What about the progressive agenda? Because yes, candidates did address, you know, black issues because we forced them to, but it kind of feels like to me, and by the way, I'm like a diehard Bernie bro. Um, I've pledged several times on this show that I'm going to use my vote for a third party. I'll say I'm still thinking about it, but um, basically we did have a lot of equity in the primaries, like Bernie's policies on Medicare for all, the elimination of student debt and more were hugely popular. And now we've seen those policies totally disintegrated with the Democratic nomination of Joe Biden, someone who's kind of going to more stick to the status quo in terms in terms of social welfare. And a black agenda is great, but a black capitalist agenda will do nothing for issues of housing, healthcare, and poverty that still disproportionately affect communities of color. So I guess the question really is, what's the policy incentive for leftists and young progressives like myself to vote for Biden? That, that was a big question and there was a lot there so let's try to unpack it if we can I mean the first thing is a lot of Bernie's ideas and policy proposals have been implemented into the democratic platform but that's in the weeds and nobody cares about that we only care about the person who's running for president of the United States and yes uh, Joe Biden does not uh, fully endorse the Green New Deal right we, we, we've all he just gave a speech the other day on climate change, but didn't go as far as the Green New Deal. But what he is talking about is environmental justice. What he is talking about is doing something this country hasn't done in a very long period of time, which is invest in our infrastructure so that we can actually put people to work and so that we can get clean water in places like not just Flint, but there are a hundred other cities like Denmark, South Carolina, where I'm from. So you, you have to couple those things together. 
and and let me just say this: uh, I want to I want to hone in on healthcare for a second because it's usually number one people's number one issue. And while people are talking about Medicare for all, we do know that Bernie's plan itself would take ten to fourteen years to implement. What we are going to get right now, and without that level of uncertainty, when Joe Biden's elected, we're actually going to get a public option, right? We're actually going to have everyone in this country covered. So what a, what the Affordable Care Act did was amazing. By the way, it might be unraveled with the death of RBG because the Fifth Circuit case will now go up and you'll have a 4-4 tie. And you know that means that the underlying court's ruling hell. But let's just say this, you have the Affordable Care Act that you build upon, right? And, and you know, I, I hear people and I, I respect Medicare for All. I am somebody who is decently supportive of Medicare for All. But even more importantly than that is access to quality care. Like we have, we have places in South Carolina, and this is why Joe Biden, other than the trust factor, other than actually being able to uh, uh, have a familiarity with, with Joe Biden, it was the fact that he was talking about access to care. While people are talking about Medicare for all, we understand that we want to get to that. How do we get to that? It's actually having the Affordable Care Act, building on the Affordable Care Act and having a public option, right? So we're doing all of those things, but when you don't have a hospital to go to, right? Um, when, because Southern states didn't expand Medicaid, um, because the Chesterfield County Hospital and the Bamberg County Hospital, all these places that are just small town rural American and Benny Thompson's district, you have hospitals that completely shut down, completely. And so when you're talking about ensuring people have access to, the care, to quality care, and not only that, you have Kamala Harris as a vice president who actually talked about my number one issue. My number one issue is African-American female mortality. Um, she talked about it long before it became a progressive thing, right? She talked about it way before Elizabeth Warren even filed a bill. Like this is something that's near and dear to the hearts of many people of color, especially many, many, many black women. And so on healthcare, you have someone who is, uh, you know, the funny thing is you're like, not you in particular, but people always ask the question, where is Joe Biden on healthcare? We want to get the Medicare for all, et cetera. And there are a lot of us who want to get the Medicare for all, but understand that there's a step in between. Well, Bakari, I'm sorry to um, okay. interrupt if I am. No, you're not. I, do just, appreciate, just... I do appreciate your answer. And I do think health care is a really important component of it, especially considering- It's the number one issue for most Democrats in the country. No, it is. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so it should be. But I guess I want to know more about what, what brings young voters to the poll, because there is nothing, yes, he's working with Biden in terms of like, fortifying his policy platform to include voters like myself that may be on the fence. However, he is not a fan of relieving student debt. He, he is, that's not true. That's actually, that's absolutely not true. So Joe Biden is, abs uh, he, Joe Biden is absolutely a fan of, of, he actually put out a plan. So I believe it's, it's families that make under $100,000 um, will be able to have an opportunity to go to school for free in this country. So if we're talking about free college and free junior college, that's one thing. Is he really, is he relieving my student loan debt? Probably not. Right. So I just need to go ahead and bite that bullet and pay Sally Mae every other month. Cause I, my, the way my student loan set up, I just kind of maneuver them around a little bit. So like, you know, that, that's, that's not a true statement in totality because Joe Biden and Kamala Harris believe that going to college, he adopted that from Bernie Sanders, going to college should be, not be a luxury, but should be an opportunity. What about student loan forgiveness? For whom is the question? So that's, I mean, first of all, let me just back up, Stanley. If it was me, I think all black people should have a GI Bill. I think that's what reparations for us looks like, right? I think all black people uh, in this country should be able to go to college for free, any state supported institution, land grant institution, et cetera. So that, let me just articulate that to you. I think that's a part of what reparations should look like. Now I ask you an even better question. So, you know, the question where, where it comes down with, where, where people come down on this is, you know, who gets that? And I think that most people, um, I think that most Democrats, oh, my son just had a stinky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think most Democrats believe that, and, and Kamala and Joe Biden come down on the fact that most people who are, um, I know, <laughs> say, hey, oh, most Democrats yeah. who, I most Democrats believe, and I think we'll get to a point where people who make under $100,000 will have their um, student loans forgiven, or there will be some type of public service. I think there should be a public service uh, uh, forgiveness. I think that first responders, individuals, especially right now, nurses, doctors, firefighters, et cetera, first responders, uh, emergency responders should have their student loans forgiven. So uh, that the question is, what does it look like? But I, I think that 
Not I think I know that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are right on board with that. I have a question for you, Bakari, because uh, can I mean- back up, though? Can I ask y'all a question now? Yeah, sure, go ahead. So like, so let's say you vote for a third party or you don't vote for Joe Biden. What does that get you? I'll throw that to Sammy. Yeah. So, <laughs> He's very vocal about that. So. But I just, I, I, I want to be educated. So I'm not ignorant when I'm out here talking about what voters look for and what voters want. So a lot of people say that third party voting is a waste because it's really the long term game that people like myself are playing. Basically, when you vote for a third party, if that party wins 5% of the electoral vote in an election, in a national election, they receive funding for the next year. And in turn, I believe that funding will help third parties grow effectively. So really what I get is the idea that knowing my voice goes to a candidate that more strongly represents presents me and possibly with convincing others that we will eventually reach that threshold and get funding and well, there's he stabilized the two party system the i hear that and i think that you know there are a lot of people who have fundamental issues with the two party system but you know and not to not to sound cynical um, but i go back to uh, king's speech and and i have a dream speech when he talked not the rhythmic cadence of i have a dream the one day we show but he talked about the fierce urgency of now and I understand you playing the long game. And I think that the privilege of being young and allow, that allows us to, like my investments, I'm a more aggressive investor. However, I will tell you that black people can't afford, my, my response to you, if we were sitting on a TV screen and had a 30 second segment, my response to you would be like, black folk can't afford to play the long game. We cannot afford to sit here right now and have tens of thousands of more of us die from COVID. We can't afford to have many more of our small businesses ravaged. We can't afford to have a Supreme Court justice go on that bench who will repeal and take back the rights that we got in the 64, 64, 65 Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act. They've already gutted Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act in 1968. The President of the United States has appointed more young judges who do not deserve to be on anybody's bench than anybody in America. He just appointed somebody who was 33 years old last week. The person was 33 years old, got a lifetime appointment, and had to put their experience as a law clerk on their application. That's like you putting on an application as a grown person what you did in high school. By the way, no offense to people who still do that, but y'all got <laughs> to stop putting you were student council president in 11th grade on your resume as an adult. That don't count, right? So, but, but I just think that right now, and I, I, I hear you, Tammy, and the funding aspect is cool. I will tell you just straight up that y'all ain't gonna reach 5% this election. Um, that, that's just a kind of like an electoral fact. But I appreciate you, you at least having a reason. What I would do is, is tell you quite specifically, and I would tell you that we want your vote and we need your vote. And even more importantly, um, you being a part of the tent, you pushing for those progressive ideals, you holding this administration accountable is how your voice will be heard. Talking about what black woman you want on the Supreme Court, talking about what policy proposals should look like is a part of a holistic discussion that we can all be a part of and all have. You know, speaking of votes that we need, and another um, coalition that we're definitely going to need is black men and Latino oh. men. But yeah. polls are showing... Gonna, we were going to have that discussion before I left here. Oh, no, for sure. Because the polls are showing that it doesn't look... They're definitely not as strong as black women and Latino Never women. Never but, are. So, so let's talk about it, because I know that you have this show with Jermaine Dupri and some other folks where you guys are being strategic and intentional about trying to co court Black men specifically to the polls. Can you, like, do you think Joe Biden will be able to do it? And as a part of that question, do you think if maybe he apologized for the 1994 crime bill, Black men may feel more favorable towards Biden? I don't even want to answer the second part of your question because I agree. I just know it ain't going to happen. And part of the reason it ain't going to happen is because uh, there are a lot of black men who, black people, clergy, congressional black caucus members who are still there who voted for that as well. Absolutely. Uh, you, know, you know, people forget the NAACP was out there championing this thing, right? People forget that the congressional black caucus voted overwhelmingly for it. Um, you know, my congressman, Jim Clyburn, voted for the 94 crime bill and still thinks it was a good vote, right? Like, we're, like what world are we living in? So let's just back up a little bit, right? Let's just back up and have a, have a discussion about black men. I think this campaign is actually doing something that um, other campaigns have not done, which is, treat, um, which is treat black men like a swing voter. Um, and they are actually directly targeting black men. The barbershop talk that you're talking about, I did with uh, Terrence J and Jermaine Dupri. 
Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, they've had one recently that had Jeff Johnson and, um, um, oh, it was, I forget who else was in it other than, oh, and Young Jeezy, right? And so, and Young Jeezy's ready to be deployed. I mean, we are actually having these discussions and it's hard doing COVID because we don't, you can't really be up under each other, right? But they're directly making efforts to go after black and brown male voters. I can tell you that those efforts are being made in the places like Philly, Milwaukee. Um, they're being made in Detroit. In fact, um, uh, I don't know if y'all know this yet. I, I don't know if it's been announced yet, but um, Kamala's going to Flint and Detroit this week, I think Tuesday. So these efforts are being made to target these voters on the ground, as on the ground as we can be. So that's first. Hispanic voters are different. And one of the things we do in our analysis thereof, and not being critical of your question, but one of the things we do a disservice of is by saying Latino voters, Hispanic voters, right? With the, with the net world. With the net world. No, because we know, right? Because we know, but no, I, and I had, to be, I had to be educated as well. There's so many different subsects and so many different groups. Like, for example, Joe Biden's doing extremely well in Arizona. He's actually having an uptick in Texas. He's doing well in Nevada because of Mexican-American voters, right? Um, he's doing poorly, not poorly, but he's he's struggling with with brown men, as we say, or Hispanic voters, as we say, in Florida, because Cuban voters, especially uh, Cuban voters of a certain age, are adamantly opposed to Joe Biden and Venezuelan voters. Um, we we know that Dominican voters and Puerto Rican voters tend to go Democratic. So that is a, a, a totally different analysis that we we can go through and we need to go through, but it just takes time. Um, but what black- about the ones in Florida? That's where... I've well, according what, what, to Politico. That's no, you're right, though, because what, what happens is, and Mark Caputo is a great guy, if you all want to want to have somebody on your show. I don't know if y'all have white people on your show, but Mark would be good if you do. Uh, but Mark, is maybe it? Stanley said, I don't know, man. I might, might not. Depends on if we can exhaust all our other invites. Uh, but Mark's, Mark's a good dude from Caputo who knows Florida, right? And he, he said the same thing. Joe Biden, Democrats, it's not just Joe Biden, but Democrats for, for decades have been losing Cuban voters. Um, you're starting to see P- Puerto Rican voters kick in. You're starting to see Dominican voters kick in. Uh, but but Cuban voters are, are, and they're becoming a much larger portion of the electorate in Florida, are trending more and more conservative as they go. Well, you know, that being said, so we're getting a lot of comments on our Facebook feed. I just want to thank everyone. Um, John Walmark is not a fan. I don't know why he keeps saying you're not being honest, Bakari, but we know we do have to wrap you up. I what am I not to... being honest about? He said he said he would respect you more if you were honest. And then he also has some pushback about the crime bill, but we know we only have you for a few more minutes. I just want to give you, you know, just some a time for final thoughts about again why it's so important for yeah, us to show up at the polls. And if you're saying vote for Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean. You know, I don't know, John. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I much rather, um, you know, have a conversation with Tammy, who is is here with us today and, and pushing back on, on me righteously. So thank you for that, Tammy. I appreciate that. I just know this. There were four million people who voted for um, uh, Barack Obama in 2012 who did not vote in 2016. Just did not vote, right? Of those four million, of those four million, this is a crazy stat over one third were black. So you're talking about, and I, I, as a lawyer, all I can do really do is count by thirds. So you're talking about 4.4 million people voted for Barack Obama in 2012, didn't show up. And you're talking about 1.2345 million black folk didn't come to the polls. And we know Hillary Clinton lost by about 100,000 votes. I appreciate today's discussion more than anything else because we didn't talk about how bad Donald Trump was because to Tammy's point, that don't move a whole lot of people. We know we knew Donald Trump was a racist, right? But the question is, what is Joe Biden going to do for us? And so I challenge everyone to go out and just learn about the candidates. Read his Black Equity Plan. Read his Black Agenda, right? Look at the people who were around him. Look at the fact that he nominated a Black woman. Did, there was a question until the last few weeks, was he even gonna do that? But look at the fact that he chose a black woman to be his VP. Look at the fact you're gonna get a black Supreme Court justice. You know, and before you even talk about the damage to people of color and black folk in particular that the Donald Trump administration has done, right? Before you even get to that, let's look at the agenda that's laid out and articulate maybe how it can be better. Because one of the things to, to um, I can't remember his name, but one of the things and this is the crazy part about how black people are treated, right? As if we can't think and chew bubble gum at the same time. 
to, I think his name was John, I don't know. But my point is that I am going to push Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to be better. I am going to push for black folk to get everything we can from this administration. But I'm also gonna work like hell to get them elected. And I feel like most black people have the ability to be able to do both. And anytime, black enterprise, anytime y'all need me to do anything, anytime I can be a part of this show where we just are talking and you know I can be wrong, I can be, but I can learn as well. These conversations are healthy, they're courageous, and they're what we need, especially from young people of color. Thank you so much, Bakari. We appreciate you. Check out his latest memoir, My Vanishing Country. It is out now. Oh, it's out now. New York Times bestseller. Check it out. Look at there that. It is. Look at that handsome boy right there. Look at that. It looks good. I'm excited about reading it. Thank you so much for your time. We would love to have you back as well. And I'll come to back, us. certainly. All you got to do is ask. I'm back. Let me know. All right, for sure. We'll definitely be in contact. <laughs> I do want to give also some time for the panel to give their last words and, and, and you know, just statements and thoughts on it. I mean, Tammy, you, you, you push back against Bukhari. Uh, you have been very vocal about being a, a Green Party supporter, a third party advocate. Um, you know, we had a great conversation. Bukhari made some very solid and profound points. Um, you know, looking forward, do you think that it will be most beneficial to black people like yourself and others to vote third party in the 2020 election. Final thoughts. Look, I can't tell you whether voting third party is going to be beneficial for you or not. Like my third party vote for me is a moral one. And a lot of people like Bakari Sellers and honestly like, you know, y'all, y'all my homies, but you know, sometimes y'all be telling me like, girl, you gotta do what you gotta do. And to me, that's, that's the moral choice. That's what I have to do. I will say that like, Bakari made a lot of excellent points. And especially with the death of a Supreme Court justice where like the nomination of a new justice is going to be pivotal in black women's rights, immigrant rights, and you know, a lot of community issues. I do think it's important that we get a blue president. Um, however, for me personally, I don't think it's important enough to like outweigh my moral need to like change the American system as it is. I was, I really liked speaking with Bakari, but he didn't really sell me on the Joe Biden dream. I felt dissatisfied with sort of his answers on poverty and debt, which is one of the number one thing that progressives talk about and one of the number one reasons that we want to change the two-party system. Well, that being said, Stanley, we're wrapping it up. I want to get your thoughts again. You know, third-party voting seemed to sort of overshadow this conversation. What What is your advice? What's your stance about empowering Black Americans come November and those of us who say third party is the answer? Um, I do not think that third party is the answer to this election. Uh, I'm not voting for Biden because I believe in him. I don't necessarily like Biden's politics, nor do I like Kamala Harris's politics. I'm voting to stop fascism. That's my moral obligation. That's it. If you live in New York State, vote for Joe Biden on the, under the Working Families Party line. Do that. Other than that, vote for Joe Biden. At this point, we just got to get this fascist out of office. We got to get him out of office. They're, 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 they're sterilizing women and, and they're sterilizing women and putting kids in cages. They're about to add another conservative to the Supreme Court. If we lose this election, there are no more elections. And I think people really need to understand that. So Biden, eh, I ain't here for him, but I don't want a fascist government. So I'm voting for him. Thank you. And, you know, just to wrap things up, um, I honestly, I agree. I feel like this, this election in itself is one of the most important ones in our lifetime, it's particularly in my lifetime. And I just can't deal with another four years of Trump. Like, I love my radicals on the left. I'm, I'm there with my, you know, super progressives. And but I'm, I'm done with the purity test. Like, I don't you don't have to be aligned with a candidate's every single, you know, policy, proposal and plan. That's not, I'm not looking for the perfect candidate. I'm looking to get Trump out of office. I'm looking to get this white supremacist out of office and I'm trying to restore some type of level of normalcy and, and, and equity and quality of life to this country. That's where my moral, moral compass stands right there, just so we're clear. And on that note, I wanna thank everyone who tuned into another episode of Be Her Talk in partnership with Black and Surprise. Thank you so much guys for the comments, the engagement. Uh, keep it here every Sunday, 2 p.m. We're talking politics and we're talking the 2020 election. So uh, we'll see you again next week. Happy Sunday guys, take care. Peace y'all.